This oral history of museum computing is provided by Sarah Kenderdine and was recorded on the 30th of April 2021 by Paul Marty and Kathy Jones. I was a maritime archaeologist, um, as you probably know, um, and working at the West Australian Maritime Museum. Um, in particular, I was working on the Indian Ocean program for excavation, which covered Oman, China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Cambodia, very exotic. Um, and I had a, an extremely clever boss called uh, Dr. Jeremy Green at the Maritime Museum that we um, were in. And um, I was hired as uh, the young blood curator, as they told me, you know, in those days. I'm the one that wrote this, the Bluffer's Guide to Maritime Archaeology for my final paper and got given an A by Jeremy and an E by the other professor. <laughs> so, yep. Anyway, so then he hires me. Great. <laughs> Um, a very clever man, and he said to me, I think it was 1993, and he said, Sarah, there is something called the World Wide Web, and I want one. <laughs> so being the dutiful young blood curator, I went and built one. <laughs> and uh, so we put it online in 1994. So maybe after others, of course, um, we put all the databases online for maritime museums. So not only ours, but connected up other ones. And um, we got uh, notes from the government saying we're the first um, uh, cultural organization in the Southern Hemisphere to have a website of note yeah, um, for a cultural, cultural place. So suddenly uh, there I am uh, having done that, I, I then started to do a master's. So I'm working full time. I did all my degrees while I was working full time. Um, and I did my master's at architecture school, kind of in information architecture, something like sailing on the Silicon Sea, you know, the, the website of the West Australian Maritime Museum. And um, that uh, I presented all over the place. And it's also what led me into, I guess, um, uh, uh, my colleagues in the States, I think it was 1997 was the first time I went to museums in the web, maybe. Um, and uh, I was thrilled to bits. I was suddenly in a community, not in Western Australia, in Perth, which is the world's most isolated city in the world, right? It is like it's that's one of its characters <laughs> characteristics so then um, uh, that was really good by that time i'd built what some people say was the first black page website you know um, animated gif of a, a coin from one of these dutch shipwrecks on the front cover some nice cut out arches and a black page no one had done that before and uh, so I can credit my, nobody does that now, by the way. <laughs> it fell out of fashion about 1999. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I started to be offered jobs and I moved. I quit my maritime archeology span job, which I think was a bit, um, uh, how should we say? Well, it was a dramatic move having been hired as the young blood curator. And I moved to Perth and to to build the Australian Museums Online Portal Gateway site. And uh, so still having maritime in my blood, one of the first things we did was live broadcasting from shipwreck excavations over satellite, right, from the middle of the ocean. So it's like, you know, it's not even 2000 yet. And we're doing these quite radical things that were really difficult to do, you know, diving on a shipwreck, broadcasting stuff up every single day over a satellite. Um, so that was, I thought, um, pretty seminal. The Australian Museums Online, we started a museum's journal for digital. And we thought, well, this is going to be great. I did this with Andrea Whitcomb, who's a, a museum theorist in Australia, wonderful person. She's written a lot about interactive media and things. Uh, 
and basically it was shunned right by the mainstream why are you starting this free online open access journal <laughs> when we are the bastions of pedagogy and academia and coming from different parts of the um of the government so we decided well we did a few issues and that was that actually we just couldn't get the traction the whole project um evaporated uh really it, it became a, a political football and i think it's really true that many of the the big portal gateways have really suffered i don't think there is one in america for instance the one in europe is europeana which is kind of an independent eu body um, but most portals never survived actually which is interesting because we all believe that the network should be about networked culture um, yeah uh, similarly i built um, a portal gateway for asean the 10 southeast asian nations um, and that was that was very political showcase so i i was working in asia a lot um and connected to that a lot and then 2000 came and the olympic games arrived in sydney right so intel came to the museum three weeks before christmas and said hey you're having the olympic games next year what are you going to do um you know what can you showcase for technology and my boss at the time was tim hart so i threw together a you know, one page statement and suddenly we had, you know, a million dollars, um, which we had to deliver on. So this was one of those crazy situations where you've shot all the stuff, you still don't have permission from the Greek Ministry of Culture, um, even though we had permits to shoot to do the whole thing, which was a web outfitter service for Intel. So very, very high end website no one spends that money on websites these days you know it was also that period where um because the tech drivers were so strong uh that they, they, they would spend a million dollars making a showcase website um it included a complete virtual reconstruction of olympia hundreds of panoramas that were shot on long poles and all this kind of thing it was very early none of this stuff had been done before and uh, we put it all online and it became, uh, you know, um, it was very important. And uh, we made a CD-ROM, it went to all schools in Australia, this kind of thing, it had many outcomes. But the outcome for me was not so much the website, um, which doesn't exist anymore because it was all built in flash, dun dun dun. And, um, you know, a million buck project, I've got a few assets, right, from that moment. And I can extract stuff from the CD-ROM, but the website, no way. The powerhouse just um, turned it off one day, and that was that. Um, so they weren't prepared to migrate it um, anywhere. <laughs> but at that time, we did this big virtual reconstruction of Olympia, and I worked with one of the universities, all the academics there, and also um, people in um, surveying sciences and things to gather all the data. And uh, we made a big 3D installation inside the galleries with all the objects that came from Athens. They'd never, never left the country before. And it was at that moment when I saw the real stuff and the digital stuff together that I got off the internet because I thought, ah, oh, this is much more fun. Internet's turned into a sewer anyway, so let's get out of town um, and go somewhere else. So, in fact, that's what I've been doing ever since. And um, I, having a great benevolent boss like Tim Hart, he then, you know, you know, in museums, there's always sea changes, right? There are the good times and the bad times. Well, the bad times came to the powerhouse. He moved, created me a job, and I moved to build a, a very big eight-sided rear projected um, uh, immersive visualization system, which was very successful five years at the museum. Now I'm building these really big machines with lots of engineers and software engineers and 
so part project management part design part curator part you know everything else <laughs> um and i was also doing a lot of field work so i was still working in various countries um mainly collecting data now not being an archaeologist basically being a a film hack you know carrying tripods and stuff like that um and so right so i'm building big machines we made many many really great shows and it became a lot to do with what people now call art and science a bit um it was in that realm and then i shot um went with a guy called peter murphy who was you know just a, an older man in in sydney who was one of these guys who could figure out the optics of stereographics really well because it was a stereographic machine and we went and shot stereographic panoramas at Angkor for a show I was building for this machine. Now, in those days, um, there are no cameras for this, right? <laughs> Nothing, zero. Um, no panoramic rotating cameras yet, but we there was one developed just after that. Anyway, so the way we did it was a single camera with this massive fisheye lens, 185 fisheye lens, and took 360 photographs in a circle and then it took every second um, a slice out of every second one to create the left eye and a slice out of the other one to cre create the right eye right this is like big manual labor but what's crazy about that if you choose one of the world's most visited world heritage sites of course is that um uh uh, tourists are walking everywhere so poor old Peter nearly had a breakdown at the end of that one because tourists are walking we are stopping the shoot they are continuing to walk then we're going chick, chick, and it was all hand done you know on a on a surveying head it was really really arcane um but the story goes on with these panoramic stereographic photos which are still extremely hard to collect um, at the resolutions of the machines that I'm building now of 20, 30,000 pixels wide. You know, I need an image that's at least that resolution in the horizontal axis of I'm taking a panorama. There are no digital rigs that will do it. And so it's still a very arcane sport. And I just shot the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism, spread of Buddhism from South India through Southeast Asia up into China, down into Korea and Japan, um, on an analog panoramic camera. So it's a beautiful camera. It has two lenses and it rotates in 360 degrees and slit film, so 220 film, which you then drum scan and then you can project at unbelievably good resolutions. We built a digital equivalent, um, a guy called Paul Burke, who I work with a lot, who's a, a stereographics expert. Um, he built a rig and the thing is that it moves, uh, it takes one minute to do a panorama, whereas with the slit scan analog camera, it's six seconds. And when you're dealing with stereo, if anything is blurry, it's a terrible photograph because stereo hates blur. Motion blur is terrible in stereo. So um, we tend to still shoot on a camera where we can't buy any film anymore. The last film stock is in a fridge in Hong Kong. It's 56 rolls. We shot all of the Astia and in India and all of Provia and <laughs> everything. It's all gone. So it's an amazing end of an era. And there is no digital thing that has stepped into the breach to say, hey, I could do this for you. So it's quite an interesting tech problem. There should be a film revival, right? Just as there are, you know, little um, 35 um, millimeter film, this is 220 medium format film that we're talking about, and you can't buy it anymore. Nor can you get it processed anywhere reliable, except in Japan. So, um, so then I'm building these big machines. Um, and uh, Tim and I, we spoke a lot about how you could turn the museum into a laboratory. Yeah. What you needed to have a fully functioning bunches of software engineers, you know, so you could experiment and build museum future type installations, right? 
Uh, and we pl plotted and planned and found spaces in the museum we thought it could go and et cetera, et cetera, and tried to seduce politicians to pay for it and what have you. Um, and I was increasingly working with universities. And then uh, out of the blue, I got invited to set up a laboratory in Hong Kong, co-establish a laboratory in Hong Kong. So I did that with Jeffrey Shaw, and it was the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment, Hong Kong Science Park. And um, uh, so that was big. That was a thousand square meters in the middle of a, a big place, you know, Hong Kong. And it was my first academic appointment. I stayed with Museum Victoria 50%. So I wasn't prepared to let go of that at all. And in fact, I stayed 50% in my museum job until I came to Switzerland, which is just a few years ago. Um, so that was great. We got into the world of big machines and I nearly died running VIP tours for three years in a row every day, every morning. I do it all the time now too. VIP touring is one of the biggest problems, yeah, because it soaks up three hours. Everybody has a fantasy project that you've got to go through with them. <laughs> and then they tell you they haven't got any money for your million dollar machines, you know how it is. Um, and they don't quite understand research frameworks, let's say. But it's what is really nice about it is, you know, you get good vibes all day long because people are really uh, very affirmative and amazed at what's what you can do. Um, and so I'm still this uh, person who is working partly in um, certainly definitely in the cultural heritage sector. I now work a lot with intangible cultural heritage. So I've been working for 12 years now with Kung Fu masters. Um, and these are, these are projects which are totally amazing. We've had nine exhibitions worldwide, uh, fundamental life change for the, for the masters themselves because the government suddenly recognizes them. They're gonna build a museum and a research center for the archive, which we created from scratch, you know, with masses of motion capture and so on. Um, and, being able to do that work in Asia is easy. Yeah, getting the same funding from a European context to do that work is is really difficult. So there are marked, markedly different relationships to this idea that you can digitize the body or that you can capture the intangible, right, um, or the ephemeral, um, and that. You know, lots of performance theorists and, and people like Diana Taylor have talked about how the archive will ossify the living, etc. While also acknowledging that um, the things like, I mean, she wasn't talking about motion capture, but motion capture has this ability to um, record um, and transmit at the same time this knowledge. So these are, are really important issues in how we start to think about digital things um, and what you can and cannot digitize, right? Because in an increasingly complex computational world, um, I think this idea, and I've been toying with it, it sounds a bit, I don't know whether the context in which I am in, which is a high-end engineering university, but now I talk about computational museology, right? And th systems thinking approaches and <laughs> whole of environment encoding and <laughs> so on. Um, and the so on is um, a big emphasis on big cultural data. So I just got a hundred got a big grant for 120,000 uh, hours of video um, archives to make the next generation um, data browsers for and um, lots of machine learning, visual analytics, visualization, HCI, this kind of stuff. So things are, um, they're, they're pretty great fun, <laughs> but it's still quite glacial in, um, in Europe. They're quite conservative. 
it's not the kind of world that uh, that Asia is, nor the kind of world that Australia was, and I think America is or was, um, with a lot of work going on, a lot of great work going on at that interface between academia and the museum, um, which is very, very rich. So the good news is I didn't really give up my museum job because I got another one. So now I direct my own museum, um, as well as being a professor. Um, and so I have this beautiful Kengo Kuma building overlooking the lake. Uh, small team, I work myself to death. So they, it's a second job, right? So I do my hoary professor job, which, as we all know, takes seven days a week, day and night, and then you add a museum director and lead curator job and producer of everything, you know, likes to paint the walls at two in the morning sort of person. Um, so yeah, uh, but we're able because I think because we fly under the radar, we can we can produce this stuff. My laboratory can produce pretty much anything. We've got amazing systems. I've got a 1500 square meter lab on the lake and I can build anything in this museum. Uh, it's more like a galleries. Um, it's not a museum. It doesn't collect things. It's an art science initiative of the university. Um, so I'm doing deep fakes art and it's double now, um, which is a, about 1200 square meter show and uh, with all my favorite things. And actually, I've got many more favorite things I realize and I can't stuff them in the show. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, we're just doing a show right now, Nature of Robotics, and then after deep fakes is um, uh cosmos archaeology so i'm working a lot with scientists now increasingly with scientists because they have real needs and this is where the humanities is has it has an amazing impact because actually they can't really see you know stuff and they really need, need visualization help um they need ways of rethinking about how they look at stuff because it's all developed in the 50s the way they view scientific data was developed then, and it's also developed for the desktop screen and their data, guess what, has gone like this, you know, absolutely exponential. So this is a really interesting um, thing that has happened in, in my last lab as well, which I established in Sydney after I left Hong Kong. I went to Sydney, built a lab there called the Expanded Perception and Interaction Center at um, UNSW. And there I built my biggest ever machine. So I'm into the big machines, actually. So this one was 56 projector, 29 computer cluster. Little panorama, only seven meters diameter. Um, 3D, obviously. Full ambisonics, full, fully tracked. I mean, a gorgeous machine. It was really, really gorgeous. But, okay, so it's expensive to build this stuff. And so it was very easy to um, become a service provider for the sciences in that context, because they have so much more money. It's hard labor to do this stuff anyway. Um, and uh, they could afford it. And increasingly, I could see that I was going to be, and it was phenomenally interesting, but going to be that, a service provider to the sciences, not doing my own thing. So. I, um, uh, they just offered me totally out of the blue to come here and said, we'll give you a museum and we'll give you a nice fancy lab called Experimental Museology and um, how would you like to do that? Come and do your stuff here. So that's what I did, even though I built that other system. Um, I think one of the things that has been very successful because I build big infrastructure with big money is being able to share it back into the glam sector, which I do a lot of, and it has good impact. So one thing I did in Sydney was buy a, you know, design, build, figure out how to build a nice traveling uh, full dome system. And 
I got together a consortium of museums to be um, to be users and develop content with them, and they all used it. And the National Museum had a show, and uh, it was so successful for them that they bought their own. You know, they would never have done that in the beginning. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's three quarters of a million dollars. It's not a cheap system. Um, but now it's touring the world with an Aboriginal songline project that we did for them in that dome. Um, and it's a watershed, won all the awards in Australia, you know, and they can tour it around the world. Um, so these are the ability to help the glam sector at the interface of the laboratory and, and the museum is, is really where I'm at now, yeah. Um, uh, and the way that academia works, also the way that museums work, quite honestly, when you're talking about museums trying to procure new media, they don't invest in house, they go out house, and they don't learn much in that process. Yeah, you know? not not normally, they tender the, the project. The guys come in, they build it, they leave, that's it, it's gone, um, it's over, you know. Um, and so for ages, I was really advocating for museums to build really robust engineering um, facilities, which some of them can do. And a lot of them have now done that in relation to the web specifically, not so much into gallery space work. That, that's because the, <laughs> I'll tell you why that is, why I think that is, that's because the, um, the, the space of the gallery floor is the most contested space in the museum. The internet, oh, well, we can just forget about that one. It's just over there, you know? We can do whatever we like out there, but if you try to put it in the gallery, uh-oh, you know? So it's, it's really interesting how that has, if, and you could say, let's take the Rijksmuseum as an example, brilliant online achievement, lots of high resolution images, zero media on the floors of their museums, zero. So it's a very interesting um, problematic. And uh, so I think it's the last frontier and that's where I'm still busy. Is that enough? <laughs> well, that's great. Can I can I jump in with a couple of questions here? Yes, yeah. Back to what you were saying about the fear of being a service provider for the sciences. Yeah. And it reminded me a couple of years ago. I was up at the University of Illinois for a visit, and I was visiting some friends at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications there. Okay. You know, and they've got the exact same kind of stuff. All these amazing immersive stuff that they can do. And, and who's using it? It's protein folding, right? And meteorological work. And, and I'm not dismissing any of that research, which is all great, but but that's where the money is. So that's where how, the money how is. does the glam sector compete with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting here at EPFL because the sciences have started to have found me also because they don't have this infrastructure and they don't know how to do it. And they're not sure whether it's science communication because it looks good or whether it's going to be good science. But anyway, so now I'm working with astrophysics on the world's largest image of the universe. Um, yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's a big black space with lots of little white dots. <laughs> No, it is. It's beautiful. It's stunning, actually. In my panorama system, it's pretty stunning. Um, and then the plasma fusion physics guys, they are putting an engineer in my lab for the same reason to, to try and... We're, we're actually going to be the European Center. EPFL will be the European Center for Computation, Simulation and Visualization, which is me for the whole of Europe for fusion physics. So yeah, no, it's I mean, it's really interesting because um, they they find me I don't know how and say, Hey, do you want to do this? And um, see, it seems to be going well. Um, the, the fusion physics guys are pretty hilarious. They said, you know, Sarah, in our science money just rains from the sky. <laughs> 
And I thought, yep, <laughs> good. <laughs> so it's funny. Um, so there is being a service provider, uh, there is, uh, but I don't feel like that here. I think um, if the directive is um, between two people who are interested or two laboratories who are interested in doing it, as opposed to a, a, maybe a university directive. Oh, that funky center down there, we better get it doing all the medical viz, right? Because we've got lots of it. Um, which comes, it keeps the center alive, but it also is a huge overhead there as well um, for how cultural projects often develop, which is, I mean, everything is slow in visualization. It's not fast, it's slow. And uh, normally, I've got a young software engineer working for me, and we're working on a small project together. Um, it's a two 82 inch LCD screens on a rotating platform. Yeah, so you can rotate them, you just walk around. It's for browsing Buddhist objects from my Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. And he said to me, you know, he's been working on it for six months. He said, when you gave me this job, I thought it would take three weeks and we're still working on it six months later. And it's the difference between making things that are good enough. And then the next bit is so hard and so painful, you don't want to do it. Um, and so that's um, that effort that it takes, people don't have a clue. And I think that's partly the problem. They have no idea. Yeah. So this is partly what your, your oral history project is about, is, is that exact thing, because it's, it's shockingly painful often. I mean, I'm dealing with large scale visualization, clusters of computers, you know, how many things could go wrong, we have every possible permutation. <laughs> We don't have too much demo effect, I'm pleased to say, but it's it can be really painful. And um, yeah, so technology, it's hardware and software together. That's the real killer, right? Yeah. Um, I think things are, uh, things got very cloudy with the advent of the head mounted display, yeah? the whole VR, because I do high end VR, I know all about it. So I look at a head mounted display, and I want to cry because it's so bad, right. But the um, uh, it had a good effect, because at least because there was a certain vibe that people were talking about, you know. Um, and, uh, and then COVID happened, more or less. And so this massive shift in the perception of the value of the digital, um, its malleability, I think, is one of its critical things. You can take this stuff and you can put it in a whole bunch of places um, in different form, mats um, and forms and different experiences. Um, so it, what is it? Publish once, publish everywhere or something. <laughs> um, but uh, you know there are these um, uh, this perceptual shift, which I think has been really good for the glam sector and the digital. Um, but let's see what happens. I mean, what what I found at the time when all the museums suddenly said, "Ah, great, um, right, we're going to get into virtual galleries and things," I thought I was back in the early '90s, right? Yeah, um, that was <laughs> pretty. <laughs> pretty crazy. Um, so I don't think things conceptually things ha are only just beginning to improve. I see a, a vast improvement in the way that online conferencing is done. Um, and that people are willing to invest the effort. I'm not sure I would bother. I quite like the zoom thing. It kind of works very functional, <laughs> etc. Um, but people are st choreographing huge events online, which never happened before. And people are building, a friend of mine has just built this extraordinary virtual world um, with Unreal Engine. And basically he's, I mean, it could be a commercial entity, but he's hoping to host 
it's like the uber second life, you know, it's like the second life you imagined was going to be there, but wasn't. Um, and it's so functional and so easy and so extraordinary, and so vast. You could just wander for days in this world, finding people doing things, other avatars, and you can host your own event and stuff. Um, you know, these are, they, they are quite seismic, these shifts, and they're very compelling. And I'm not a gamer and I'm, you know, I know a lot about computer graphics, but I'm not in that gaming world. And uh, so they're, they're very interesting um, shifts. And of course, I work now a lot with machine learning and uh, deep learning and stuff like this. Um, in a, I would say, a fairly light way, because I'm not creating arts using these tools. I'm using them as analytic tools um, to give me more access into the archive, to mine different types of data, um, or to try and get at yeah, the long tail, narratives from the long tail of, of let's say, moving image archives. Um, and what else? I mean, Can I come up with a question on data visualization in the humanities, right? Because I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the vast uh, philosophical shifts that, that you have seen happen with museum computing. I talked to a lot of our sort of digital humanities people here at Florida right, State right. and other places, and, and many of them are still fighting against the perception that that's not real humanities research. Do, do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I'm being cognizant that I'm being recorded myself right here, right? But yeah, I know there are too many people who've been denied tenure because that's not real research. That's not real how, research. How yeah, do we shift sure. that, that perception? Yeah, I mean, actually, in that sense, I would say maybe the scientists are more easygoing, you know. Um, uh, what was that quote I used to quote? It's something, uh, it will come back to me. Um, so, yes, uh, can visualization help? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the way you could say, it's been a, pan a pandemic of visualization recently, right? Because of the, of the COVID situation, everyone has learned to read infographics. Everyone now devours graphs and charts and comparative charts and things that are so complex. Sometimes I'm thinking, now, what is that trying to say to me, right? <laughs> um, so it's an inevitable byproduct of information um, uh, I wouldn't say overload, but, you know, the volume of information, it has to be presented in new ways, otherwise we won't, um, we won't be able to digest it. And of course, there are many ethical concerns in visualization. Um, is it real? Yeah. Uh, and the sciences have it as much as the humanities in that sense. So arguing use case is one of the biggest challenges in the sciences. Humanities don't really talk about use case in the same way. It's more of a gut reaction, right? Um, so I interview, I'm on a professorial committee and um, these people were, um, uh, we were interviewing them. And uh, I was surprised how little conception there was of the, um, uh, this the potential archive the potential algorithmic archive um for for mining for doing things with uh you know people still very much in the humanities think in terms of of books and objects and things they really do um and we might curate digital collections but they're digital collections of real things yeah and uh <laughs> It's very different to kind of this idea where we are, we are really going to be surfing just huge amounts of data for the same insights, um, for historical insight. And how we do that is, um, and how people can start to wield the tools that are necessary to do that, um, along with all the ethical concerns, of course. But um, yeah. 
Um, sometimes I feel like uh, we'll be uh, in the tsunami and uh, we might not pop up. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. But there's lots of great thinkers out there trying to do to think about that the whole AI for glam sector is quite interesting um, as a recognition of information abundance and the ability to mine it using new tools um, for good outcomes now yeah, one hopes um, so yeah but I, I hear you <laughs> It's also, I think there's another side to it, which is, you know, there were certain things that happened for museums in the digital, which people may have talked about or not, but, you know, the advent of Google Art Project and how that disabled the museum sector, right? Gave them sub and cameras and made them sign terrible agreements. Um, and, the, you know, no click through from their website to the museum website. This was really, um, and these kinds of things, it's a bit like the head mounted display. Everyone's got to have an immersive VR thingy. Um, and uh, it's also a bit of a rot, right? It's, um, so there are various big tech projects which have led the museum astray, I would say. Um, because of the hype factor. Well, you know, it's funny that you said that. Um, in fact, uh, in another life, when you and I have more time, uh, I, I've always wanted to write a paper about big tech projects leading <laughs> museums astray. Because, <laughs> right? Great. I I remember back <laughs> when, for example, you remember when IBM digitized the Vatican collections. Right. There was similar stuff happening then. Um, IBM went and digitized the Hermitage Museum collections, and then a researcher, her name is something like Morby, I can't remember her. She's at Mont uh, University of Montreal, I think, okay. did a great paper about the mess that they left behind. And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, totally. So there's a long history of, of big tech sort of sabotaging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, it also comes from inside. You know, I hear academics talking about mining patrimonial capital for profit, right? Aggregate it, mine it. That's the Google thing, right? Well, that's a bit mixed up with brand presence, but um, it's basically if you've got it, you've got assets you can mine and resell. And um, Ancestry.com, that's it, actually. It's the perfect example of, of mass um, exploitation of, of patrimonial heritage. <laughs> I mean, a money-making venture, but it does good service, right? So, you know, people are really into it. So, you know, that's okay. Um, but when it comes to museum world, there's a slightly different um, proposition. And I think that the, I mean, we all know that Google bought the um, the Google Art project in Paris, you know, the big headquarters for Google Art, um, because the French public were going completely berserk about the fact that Google wasn't paying any tax. And, um, and you know, when you look at the cameras that they use and the bullshit um, that they presented to museums, you know, they're going around with a DSLR camera taking a few snaps and stitching some pretty terrible images together. And um, we're all in the museum world, we're all doing quality work, which is 10, 1500 times better than that. And, um, but Google comes in the door because the director thinks <laughs> that it's, you know, the thing to be in. And, um, and so then Google built that housing around their DSLR camera, pretending it was something else. And it never was, it was just the same kit. And that was really hilarious. Anyway, um, yes. So they bought a nice big heritage building in the middle of Paris because they don't pay any tax. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and um, yeah. I, I'm reminded of similar stories about when, um, laser scanning of like the Parthenon or, or things like this, right? Yeah. Where I know a lot of his, art historians were like, well, that's gonna give us really useful data, but it, all, it almost always ends up helping the tech company more than yeah, the art sure. historian. Right? Sure, like um, Autodesk and those, that crowd. Um, 
And then there were all those crazy things that archaeologists were doing it, you know, when they repainted the arch from reprinted the they made a 3D model of the arch um, from Palmyra that was blown up and then they reassembled it and carved it out of Carrara marble. And then they toured it around the world. So it launched, um, Boris Johnson launched it in Trafalgar Square, you know, at one to one scale. It was massively scandalous, right? It, nobody knew what to do with this thing. Like, was it the right thing to do? Or was it the wrong thing to do? So there's very interesting things in the in the digital and um, how it now acts in the world, um, how it acts in terms of heritage at risk, how it denies the past by recreating it. Um, it denies history by recreating it. Um, and people were really worried about that. There were academics who were saying, if it gets bombed, that's part of history. Why would you reconstruct, you know, that debate in conservation and restoration and all that kind of stuff? Um, but everyone felt it was in terribly bad taste to build it, launch it into Fraga Square, and then trip it around the world with a few champagne cocktails, you know. <laughs> um, that, so this deep fakes show I'm doing is really trying to address these issues. Um, so it's everything about the digital twin and the doppelganger, but it's also about neo-colonialism and the, which is something like Google does, right? They hoover up the world um, in a, in a neo-colonial way and, uh, and they hold the assets. It's exactly the same process that the BM and every, all our other big museums have been involved in um, at a certain point. So, uh, yeah, it looks at those issues. It looks also, of course, at the auratic issue, the aura issue, the um, um, authorship, um, authenticity, of course, and all the rest. And then it moves on to blockchain and forensics and um, uh, cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I just posted into the chat the reference to the article that I just mentioned. Oh, little. fantastic. Yeah, okay, if, great. If you've never read that, it's a very interesting look at what happened at the Hermitage Museum when IBM right. came in and partnered with them, right? Super interesting. Yep, would love to write that book sometime. Unintended consequences <laughs> of big tech and, and, and cultural heritage, right? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Well, be, because, you know, I, I'm not I'm not saying that people, you know, that IBM sets out to wreck a culture, right? Because I don't know. No, I, don't no. They, they, I think they're that sometimes quite innocent. I wouldn't say Google was innocent because of the way it developed, right? They might have stumbled into it, um, but I wouldn't say they were innocent. Well, let's not leave Microsoft out of this either with Corbis. Right, right. But Sarah, uh, we have to leave you soon. But yeah, sorry, I'm driving I'm, away. I don't want to leave before asking if you have recent articles written about this work that you're doing or the deep fake exhibit. I'm about to because dun, 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 um, I, uh, I just decided, so Routledge have been encouraging me to write some books, but I'm busy, right? You know, in the museum studies, they're always encouraging all of us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> do something. Um, and so I've decided to give their open source publishing a, a go. I was about to run a symposium for deep fakes and I've decided to make it a book instead. But using this open source publishing and the first, the great thing about it, it's a op open source, open access publishing. And their model is basically you publish um, you can publish chapters as you go, right? So I don't have to have all the book written. I can just have the bit I need to write written <laughs> um, and then get my nice friends around the world um, to, to write on these topics and build the book over time, which is kind of nice. It's also not nice in that you might have a book that never ends, but you know, um, you could always be adding chapters. You can also revise these books so you can take chapters where the information has gone out of date and revise it, which is quite interesting too. Um, so 
that would be one I publish a bit yeah i've got a few things I, I did a couple of open access you know pay for the gold pass kind of things recently, so I could. Um, uh, send you those. Sure, that'd be great. Yep, I, I did one for the um, screen, which is, um, I think it, or what is it? Anyway, it's quite a good press. It's all about immersion. Um, and uh, it's a film journal, so it's really future cinema stuff. Um, but you know, I've got lots of articles on various things. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> but the deep fakes caught my attention, I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I think it, you know, in a way, we've all been talking about these issues. And this is at one level, it's not it's not gonna cover everything because it's a big topic. But um uh yeah, it should be a really fun show. And Irina Bakova, the ex-director general of UNESCO, is gonna open it. Um it's now really the thing. Um, she recognizes that. And this is really great. Um, a, a big, uh, big sea change in the big organizations, I think. Yeah. I also wanted to, to say that I was really glad that you mentioned the story about uh, visual capture of the Kung Fu masters. Oh, yeah. I, I still remember when we were hanging out at that conference in Manchester and you were talking about that project. Right. Then, and yeah, that sure. Super cool, right? No, really it's cool. super cool. You know, I still have a, I have PhD students working on it all the time. We're still doing it. It's massive. I mean, if you take that kind of archiving seriously, it's life's job. That's the other thing. <laughs> Yep, probably doing it all my life, but we're expanding it now also to it. Um, there's an amazing European reenactment um, tradition for martial arts, which is based on 16th century manuscripts. And um, we are, um, are um, uh, looking at a comparative analysis between South Chinese Kung Fu and um, and these martial arts traditions. So. I'm hanging out with the sword fighters now. It's fantastic. They're really, the Italians, I have to tell you, wow, pretty impressive. They all live in castles and have got Irish wolfhounds as, as dogs, you know, and um, make their own swords in forges. I mean, it's a, it's a trip. It's totally great. It's reenactment culture as you could possibly want it to be. And, and who funds that? Or are they independently wealthy or? Yeah, that's the one. Independent. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, it's a club worldwide of these independently wealthy people. <laughs> yep. The rest of us, we just got to hang out where we can get it. <laughs> but it, but it is amazing to use those techniques to capture that that knowledge and the the, the body movements, right? Uh, to make that kind yeah. of archive that didn't exist before. Sure, and it's very rich. So there's many, many different types of documentation and experiments and things. And my student now is a data scientist and she's just building ontolog motion ontologies, which is great, right? Because if we don't take real care of this archive, because it was built in such a crazy ad hoc way and we're having exhibitions like mad and it needed, it needed a curator. And um, now it's she's doing an amazing job. She's Chinese, and she's she's really great. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that reminds me. I know somebody in the school of dance here at my university who studies choreography with oh, right. uh, motion capture, right? right? Uh, and that must be a whole big area in dance too. It's a big area. So I mean, William Forsyth was the guy, the dancer that really got into motion capture and. And not even that as much as annotating a form or analytics of form of motion forms. And but now I just noticed there's a choreographer in Britain who's got together with, I think, Microsoft and using AI for for motion detection in his dance performances. And it's exactly what we are doing in our motion um, archive. I have like all these young, super bright master's students who are all machine learning experts. Um, they're all in computer science. I only teach computer scientists these days. 
Ron, this is where the ontology question really captures my interest, right? Because yeah. do we we don't really have a good ontology for sharing no. this this no. information to make it no. searchable. Exactly, exactly. So that's what she's working on. And I think it's it's gonna be really great.